Hi, um, my name is Andreas Müller. I'm from a company called Misopo. We used to be called Sencha, but then a larger company moved to Denmark. It was called Sencha, and then we were like, shit. Um, so, uh, and we uh, do analytics for the real world, as we, we call it. I have a little bit about myself first. I'm the co-founder CTO of Misopo. Uh, I used to work as a full stack engineer in London as a contractor for a few years for various companies. And then when my startup got some traction, uh, moved back to Denmark to work on that. Um, as we, we like to say, we do plug and play analytics for the real world. Um, and that basically means using object detection and machine learning to pull out information from the real world and then send that data to the cloud in an anonymous format so that various people like city planners, like big business owners, there's various people can use this data to enrich either their uh, business or their, um, their general job and, and, and occupation. Um, this demo um, is taken with a temporary camera set up to just record this because one of the big problems doing something like this is that if we put up a camera like that, that would be completely illegal and um, it would violate like all sorts of privacy issues. Uh, so in order to still be able to do this, um, or I like to skip them, we built this guy. And this is a sensor that has all the deep learning, machine learning running on it, on a NVIDIA Jetson chip. And all the data that comes in through the uh, optical sensors are processed on it and no personal information ever gets stored on it or leaves the device. And that's the only way we can do what we do in a legal and privacy conscious way. Uh, of course, the problem with that is that that's, that's a piece of hardware that we then had to build. Um, now, before we move on from that, there's a bit of a story to how we got there. Because when we started uh, back in 2014, this was like a part-time company and we were doing like analytics for retail stores using some simple algorithms and some point of sale systems. And we kind of just went with wherever the customers then were. So we went from that to doing uh, car detections for, um, for automobile industry. Uh, we then went on to build a queuing app for the automobile industry. So when customers would come in, there would be like a queuing system that actually then related to the car they came into. So all this data sort of was combined into the point of sale system. And we've been around a lot of things because we never raised any funding, so we had to bootstrap it. And that kind of just meant running in whatever direction we had paying customers. Um, and that sort of raised the question of, if you literally don't know what your company is gonna do in six months, like we don't know what technology you're gonna use, what industry, and what are all your product is. And that's been true for, well, it's not true any longer because we have a long-term investment now, but, but for the first two years, we really had no idea what we were doing the, in six months. So the question is when, when you have to choose how, how to build your, your, your products and what technology to use, how do you make a choice that allows you to really adopt change at a absurdly rapid um, pace? And combined with this, I was, at the time when we started, I really loved Elm. I still really love Elm. Um, and I was looking into adopting that, at least for the web development. But there was one issue is that we, for our queuing car dealership app, we realized that, okay, it needs to be an app. Like, it has to be an app. And we're definitely not going to write it as a native normal app because I don't know how to do that. So React Native was really the only game. And reason React Native, as we, we then used, for, for this was quite a good choice to get um, all of these things in. So what, what Reason really gives us is that we can make somewhat bold choices in you choosing a very young language, but there's always JavaScript just underneath. So if you're really going the wrong direction, you can just drop a, a level low and fix it and then go back up to writing Reason. So the risk in that, it's never that bad. You never go, right, I completely screwed up and I have to start over you always have the option of saying, okay, that only worked until here, and then I have to go and fix this in JavaScript and then go back. And you can do that in Elm, you can do that in some of the other languages, but Reason makes that very simple. 
And in the early stages, and especially when you don't know what, what technology you're going to work with and what kind of things you're building, that actually is really, really powerful. And the other thing that um, I think a lot of us never really talk about and, and maybe haven't realized is that um, JavaScript is not actually a very agile language. Like, it's not a very good language for truly agile development. And that sounds really weird because like those two words almost goes together. Like agile developers of like the web front end teams, they're super agile, but you know, the back end Haskell teams or whatever they are, we consider them somehow less agile. But the reality is that agile is really about not knowing what kind of changes are coming your way. And that means that I don't know, like maybe my app is gonna get scrapped. Like the queuing apps, we threw them out because there was no potential and then we went a different way. But maybe my app, maybe I know now what six months is going to look like. But maybe there's a different client coming in saying, actually, that's great, but could it do more like this? And we've had that happen several times, saying the basic idea is right, but we have this use case. So how, how do you design around the notion of constant change coming in? And the reaction is what you need for constant change is you need a lot of refactoring. Your data model changed. Your, whatever you represent, what your, the features you have changed, and if you just try and tack them on, like your app is gonna be unmanageable really quickly, but if you actually have the option of going, right, now that I have this concern, these are the changes I wanna make to my fundamental data model, and therefore to the rest of the app. If you can do that efficiently, then you can actually be agile. So responding to really largely changing environments in something like Reason, something that has a strong type system, is much, much easier than dynamic languages. And you could argue in that way that dynamic languages are a lot more static in terms of you make your choices, and then ideally you stick with them because they're quite expensive to change later. Where the static languages actually have the opposite. You can change it, and it's really quick. Like, and I think we've all, if you've coded Reason for a while, you know that you make decisions. Like At some point you go, I'm not going to spend you know, that much time thinking about, am I gonna do a record for this? Is it gonna be a tuple? It doesn't matter, you can just change it, it takes five minutes. So you can actually, you can really work in a super agile way um, with a language like Reason. Now the other concern we had was that at that time I was the only Reason developer and we were sort of like, okay, is it a good idea for a startup to go and choose a language that a lot of the people we want to hire never even heard of. And it turns out, and we've only tried it at a sample size of one so far, turns out it takes about a week from nothing to reason. This was the old syntax. This was back in July. It takes about a week, the up to speed. And about after two weeks, they actually started being more productive than they were in JavaScript, which to me is amazing numbers. Like that's, but, but the reality is that all of the gotchas are almost gone. There's still issues. There's still a lot of things that needs to improve, but the very core of the language allows you to get on board quickly, make really rapid changes, and actually start developing at a really, really fast pace. And it's a very safe way of doing it. Like, you don't break a lot of things when you do it. So, so far, I'm really happy with that decision. Of course, everything I just said is kind of after rationalizing. The reality is I thought it was shiny and fancy and I wanted to try it, so that's but it turns out that all the arguments I just gave actually hold really well as well. And we've been really, really happy with making that choice. And we intend to move as much as we can and make sense to reason. We, of course, now we're an IoT company and big data. And we're considering putting something on the blockchain because we're like missing two or three keywords just to get all of them. We also need some sort of VR interrupt. But all of these areas, uh, reason actually makes a lot of sense. It'll be a great IoT language because it compiles to any platform that's ever been made. So there is a lot of potential there, and it's, it's, it's constantly moving fast in the right direction, and it allows us to do the same. So yeah, that's, uh, no, there's no more. Good. Um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, that, was, that was sort of our story of, of what we've, how we've found it working with reason for the last, seven, eight months.